All right, so chapter four, the structure of the human act. Like the previous chapters, it has two sections, but these sections work together much, much more clearly, and they also kind of flow into each other, and it's also much shorter. Uh, so I didn't really split this one up. Um, but we will, I'd like to at least, tackle this in terms of the two separate sections. Uh, one being this distinction between voluntary, involuntary, and non-voluntary. So whether an action is voluntary or not, what is the place of the will with respect to whether we're making choices, whether those choices are our own, or whether those choices are forced, or anything like that. And then the other section is the, the sort of the psychological mechanics of how we make choices, how the intellect and the will interact with one another. And so these are generally uh, two different aspects here of how we make choices. But they both inform each other as well. So first of all, questions or anything we want to go over from that first part uh, as to what makes an action voluntary, involuntary, or non-voluntary, or if this difference makes sense. OK. We can get to that next. But for this part in particular, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, let's say in the example of Jake's where he chose multiple people mm -hmm. and he kidnapped them, mm -hmm. and he made them have choices. Were those actions, would you say, voluntary still, that they got to make a choice to save someone, or was it involuntary? OK, so this comes into the question of force. Uh, not just force, but when he's talking about um, choices made out of, uh, out of fear or out of cons um, constraints on one's choices, on, one's, on the possibilities of choice. Um, he deals with this, with this problem in a kind of cursory manner. So I want to say from the outset, I quite frankly don't think that his answer to this, to this part of the question is sufficient. So we still have the jigsaw problem for, for Aquinas and for McInerney. And it's still not quite fully addressed, I don't think. It gets addressed, I think, much better in, uh, by Anselm, which who we're going to read when we come back from break. So he's going to tackle this issue in particular in, on freedom of choice. Um, I mean, not, not the case of the Saw movies, but that type of scenario where, uh, where we are where we are forced into a given situation where our choices, our only choices, are bad choices. You know, putting yourself through some horrific torture in order to save yourself or somebody else, this is not a good choice. But given the circumstances, um, Aquinas certainly will say that your choice is voluntary. You do, in fact, voluntarily choose to act in one way or the other in a constrained set of circumstances like that. The reason for, for that is that it is still deliberate. You're still considering your alternatives and selecting one. Uh, the will is still inclining itself towards one rather than the other. And in, in doing so is selecting one option as the better option than the other. Even if it's not saying, well, this is in fact a good option, one that I would pursue, all other things equal without any other circumstantial constraints. Um, but it is still selecting one over the other. And so therefore, it is still voluntary. The particular choice that you're making is voluntary. Now, being in the situation, clearly involuntary. That is the action of somebody else that constrains your choices. Um, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm drawn to, what's the example that he uses of? Uh, it's not the being stuck in the desert one yet. It's the other one. Okay, so here we go. I hurry along the boardwalk towards the saltwater taffy stand when my arm is suddenly grasped and I am propelled to, uh, through the swinging doors of a tavern against my will. I had been going for taffy. I'm propelled across the sandstrewn floor, however, the aroma, uh, as I am propelled across the sandstrewn floor, however, the aroma of beer assails me. My resistance ceases, and I cooperate in my progress toward the bar. Okay. So, to reiterate, or to, to resummarize, you're walking along, somebody grabs you, pulls you into somewhere, and you decide, huh, I guess I'll stay. 
Aquinas would consider this two separate actions, one involuntary and then the second voluntary. The first one, being involuntarily yanked in a particular direction, is not an elicited act of will, as he calls it. It is not you making a decision. It's simply something that happens to you. However, your decision of what to do upon being brought into the, into the bar, in this case, that's voluntary. The same would apply in a sort of, uh, in a sort of jigsaw-like scenario, where you know, someone puts you into a situation against your will, but then gives you a choice of what to do within that situation. Being placed into the situation is involuntary, but the choice that you make within that particular situation is, is still strictly voluntary. That make sense? Now, there are problems and faults with this that Aquinas doesn't fully deal with, I don't think. And that is not, I don't think that's really McInerney's fault uh, in his descriptions. Because having read the relevant parts of Aquinas, Aquinas is not particularly concerned with, uh, with what he calls perplexus. That is, uh, moral dilemmas. Being put in a situation where there are no good options. Uh, he says, well, you're still responsible for the choice that you make, um, and so the choice that you make is still your voluntary choice, and that's all there is to it. But come on, there's more to it than that, and we'll, we'll have to talk about that a little more next time, because it's obviously the situation's more complicated than that. Um, so again, we'll look, at this, uh, we'll look at this when we read Anselm, because I think Anselm, despite writing a couple hundred years before Aquinas, does a much better job of, of dealing with this situation, this kind of a situation. The other example he gives is this stranded in the desert one, uh, where he's driving through the desert. He has a certain amount of gas left. It's not enough to make it to the next, uh, to the next service station, uh, the next gas station, basically, um, with his current load of a trunk and backseat full, full of philosophy books. So he decides, tragically, that he must pitch them off into the desert and go and get fuel. Have you ever moved books? Like, like moving, like, like in, the, in the course of moving, like either from house to house or apartment to apartment or office to office or whatever, trust me, books get heavy. Um, I have had a, uh, a crate of books, about yay big or so, in the back of my car. Drive a minivan. It sinks with that. It like... It noticeably sags with one large crate of books in it. Uh, books get very heavy very quickly. Uh, so it, it would actually make one hell of a difference if you had a trunk full of books in terms of gas mileage. Um, I don't know exactly how much, if it would make up the 15 mile or whatever it was difference that he needs out of four gallons. Eh, he's pushing it, but maybe. He might make it. He might make it a lot closer, in which case he might still like, be able to cross that last mile or two and survive. Um, but yeah, if you've, uh, like, next time you got to move, just, just fill, a, uh, fill a milk cart, just a milk carton with nothing but books, and then wrench your back trying to lift it. It'll happen. I know better than to do this because I've moved books quite a lot. As an academic, it's, it's, it's a common occurrence. But it, it's the kind of thing that's very surprisingly heavy. Because, you know, it's, it's paper, right? But I mean, this is just wood. Realistically, it's about as heavy as dense hardwood uh, when you pack them together nicely. It's also one of those. So, if you're ever putting up a bookshelf, you'll you'll want to secure it to the wall at the top. And the reason for that is, if you have a full bookshelf and it falls on you, you will die. There's very little. There, there's a very low chance of survival if a large bookshelf falls onto you. It's because not because the shelf is heavy, but because all of the stuff on it is incredibly heavy. It's one of those one of those weird dangers that a lot of people don't quite think of. But a lot of bookshelves that you'll buy nowadays has the little attachment thing that a lot of people unfortunately neglect and die. Or don't, and everything's fine, but they get lucky. I went on quite the tangent there. I apologize. Yeah. God, what the hell kind of a question is that? I have no idea. It's in the hundreds. It's certainly in the hundreds. Um, I have. Let me see. In my living room, I have two bookshelves that are almost completely full. In my office, I have two bookshelves that are completely full, plus several in a crate. Most of them. Now, 
a lot of them that I have read, I have used as reference books. So I will read sections of it and go back to different sections of it later for different things, that kind of thing. Um, you'll seldom find an academic who doesn't have something of a library. Um, I, also, a good deal of them are my kids' are like kids' books, or my kids' books, a couple of shelves worth of kids' books, and a lot of them are my wife's books as well. She reads a lot, and she's she's. Uh, so she, she has a lot of uh, a lot of books and things as well. Oh, and actually, <laughs> I completely I completely forgot. I also have two shelves of books that are still at my parents' house that I probably should get rid of at some point or take with me like, from high school and college that I never moved. <laughs> it would yes. Yeah. Um, a bookshelf is usually heavier than a couch. It's good, I mean, not without reason. It's quite dangerous. Um, I, I actually do believe that, would, that it would significantly impact your gas mileage. When I was reading that, I, I thought, I was thinking like, oh no, that's perfectly reasonable, of course it would. But then it, it strikes me now having this conversation that that might seem implausible to some. That, oh, a trunk full of books, oh, well, that's nothing, right? No, no. <laughs> Especially if you're driving a Yugo. Um, to go back to last time's analogy. Um, Yes. I realized that after the fact, that that suddenly makes sense. Um, anyway, anyway, the point being is that his decision to get rid of his books is strictly voluntary. But he points out that it is not one that he would make under normal circumstances. Right? Dumping his book collection into the desert is not something that he would would otherwise be willing to do. However, under the circumstances, what he is doing is lightening the load on his vehicle to survive, and so it, he's prioritizing he's prioritizing one thing over another, given difficult circumstances. And so, and, and one way that he describes this, I think, is pretty right. He says, um, "This comes down to saying that I take responsibility for throwing away my library in those circumstances." I would be a fool not to. That does not mean that I enjoy it. So he's saying that, no, no, this actually was the right decision. I hated doing it, but it was the right decision. It was not a good decision, but it was, it was the way of avoiding a, uh, a much worse consequence. It was fulfilling an obligation that I had to you know, maintain my life uh, in a responsible manner, um, but doing so in a way that, that I would not like to do. Yes, he could have. Uh, he could have determined that it's worth the risk and kept going. Wound up 15 miles short of a gas station and wound up dead in a desert somewhere. Or, or, as he indicated, he could have kept all of his books, ran out of gas 15 miles short of a gas station, and then some kindly stranger had happened to come by and give him a ride to the gas station, picked up a can of gas, drove back to the car, and then drove home. But he made the decision not to rely on that possibility, because that's quite unreliable, to say the least. And we do have something of an obligation to preserve ourselves in some responsible manner. What else in here in this section? Or general questions about the issues of voluntary, involuntary, and also non-voluntary? Yeah, so that would be non-voluntary. No, um, that would be voluntary. Right? Non-voluntary is when you do something unintentionally that you would have done anyway. Is that what, oh, so like the neighbor killing, or you killing your neighbor that you wanted to kill? Yeah. I, again, another one of these, he's really on, on a deer hunting streak and neighbor hunting streak in, this, in these couple of chapters. I don't know what it is, but yeah, he says, okay, um, I want to slay my neighbor. Just Great way to start a thought experiment. Great. Okay, fine. I'm I'm out hunting. I spot a deer, which then disappears. I go in hot pursuit. Movement ahead suggests the deer is there, and I shoot. When I reach the spot, I find that I have killed my hated neighbor and not a deer, 
But that is something I wanted to do. The second example is one of antecedent ignorance. Um, the point is that uh, this is non-voluntary action. This is what Thomas calls non-voluntary action. When I really, uh, when what I really do is something I would not have done if known, the action is involuntary. So if you had known it was your neighbor in the bush, not a deer, would you have shot it? Would you have, would you have pulled the trigger or not? Well, assuming you want to kill him, right? If you, if you're, if you are with murderous intent, then it was non-voluntary. So because it wasn't technically an action, you did not, you did not kill your neighbor in the sense that you, know, you lined up the shot and pulled the trigger and did so intentionally, deliberately, and with due consideration and with the end in mind. It's merely something that happened by accident, but it was a, from your odd and twisted perspective, a fortunate accident. One that you, uh, one that, well, this means I don't have to go and kill him, I guess, something like that. Another example might be something like uh, a still uh, a still unethical example might be um, if you were suppose you're sh you're out shopping and you neglect to notice something at the bottom of your shopping cart when you're checking out, um, and then on your way out you you find that uh, when you get home you find that you have accidentally shoplifted, but then you think you know what it's fine I was probably going to steal it anyway. <laughs> Or I would have, or it's fine. I would have done this any. I would have stolen it anyway. That was a little big, but I had. I, I hope not. But <laughs> I've, I've, I'm pretty sure I've done it before too, right? This is the kind of thing that happens by accident, usually involuntarily. It's the kind of thing that, if you had noticed that you would have forgotten, you probably would have been, oh, whoops, I need to go back and pay for it, right? If you were like, on your way out of the store, but there's a, there's some point at which you did it involuntarily, and you're probably not going to go correct it. Maybe you will, probably morally laudable if you do, but at some point, here's a real world example. I accidentally stole a DVD from a library once. Oh no, I know, it's terrible. Um, by that I mean I borrowed it, it got lost packing when I was moving, and then I went to go return it and it was gone, it was already packed up. I was like, oh well. Uh-oh, I must have lost it. And then I found it like six months later as I was eventually unpacking that last box tucked away somewhere. And I said, oh, hey, I must have stolen this. Oops, right? It's involuntary. I didn't intend to do that. Uh, and I wouldn't have done it if I had known that it was packed away in that box in particular. I would have opened the box, taken it out, and given it back. But I didn't know where it was, and so I neglected to do so. I, I acted. I acted by taking that box and moving away. Right. That kind of thing. It, it would have been non-voluntary if I had already been planning on stealing it, or even just in retrospect said, eh, screw the library, they'll get a new one. Right. In which case it would be non-voluntary. It, it, it all, again, depends upon the inclination of your will and your, your sort of post hoc approval or disapproval of the action. Is it something that you would have done anyway? Then it's non-voluntary. It's non-voluntary because you still didn't do it. You still did not act upon it in the properly voluntary way, but you would have if you'd known about it. It's involuntary if it was something that happened, but you wouldn't have done it if you'd known, if you had more knowledge about the situation. Use the example of Oedipus. Right? So um, Oedipus marries a widow without knowing that she is his mother, that, that, that whole debacle. right? Um, he did, not see what, he did not see what he was really doing, and if he had, he would recoil in horror from the deed. So if he had known what he was doing, he wouldn't have done it. And so we call that involuntary. Uh, again, involuntariness due to ignorance. You'll notice that, um, that he makes a bit of a, an inadvertence here. You, I don't know if you noticed this. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Uh, he gives three ways that ignorance can be related to acts of the will. Concomitantly, which is the source of non-voluntariness. Antecedently, which is the case of involuntariness. Or consequently, which he doesn't explain at all. Yeah, so consequently, uh, ignorance, or consequent ignorance is ignorance, is that next thing he talks about, but he doesn't call it that. 
It's ignorance as a consequence of your deliberate choices. You can choose to remain ignorant of something. That's what he's talking about there. He doesn't clarify that there, but I will for you. So there you go. Yes? So like saying the example of when he was hunting and then he accidentally killed his neighbor, mm -hmm. wouldn't it also be ignorance of the fact that he was not paying attention to where he was shooting? That, that is a possibility, right? He might have, he might have um, consequently, in this sense, not like deliberately not paid attention to what he was shooting at. Like, you know what? I'm on my neighbor's property. It's probably a deer, but if it's not, well, whichever. If it's the deer, cool, I get a deer. If it's my neighbor, cool, he's dead then. That's great, right? That is deliberate ignorance. Right? That is choosing not to find out. And so you are morally responsible in that case. Right? That's voluntary. You are, you are at least voluntarily ignorant. This is like trying not to figure out uh, the consequences of your actions. Because you know that if you really think it through, then you're probably going to have some nasty consequences and you're gonna, you would want to avoid that. But you really want to do the thing, but you really don't want to think about the consequences. So you try not to think about the consequences so you can do the thing. Catch all that? OK. Good. That's, that's this extra kind, where ignorance can be, uh, can be, you can be morally responsible for ignorance, in other words, if it's intentional, if it's deliberate, if it's chosen. I will say this latter part here is a long digression that he sort of punts on at the end and says, well, we'll deal with that in the next chapter. And so we'll kind of deal with that in the next chapter. This whole thing about could you be completely and systematically ignorant about moral principles in general? Like, could you have the wrong idea about ethics to the point where you think evil is good and good is evil? And so you're completely ignorant of what good is to be done and what evil is to be avoided and to the point where it would mitigate your culpability. And he says, mm, we'll deal with that later, basically. He says it's probably not possible in the long term, at least, but we'll figure out under what circumstances it might be and why. Um, so we'll figure that out eventually. That's basically what he's saying. Well, yeah, kind of. OK. The three ways ignorance can be related to the act of will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what, I was, that's what I was kind of just talking about, right? So I'll reiterate. So concomitantly, consequently, antecedently. Concomitantly is what produces non-voluntary action. Hi, Professor McCoy from the editing room over here, and I just realized that I got these terms backwards. So I'm going to be putting up the corrected terms up on the screen as I go through this next section of the lecture. Sorry for the confusion, but I hope this helps. So the will is aimed at some end. You're your action accidentally achieves that end, and you say, oh, cool, it worked out. You didn't, in, you didn't voluntarily perform the action, you didn't voluntarily achieve the end, but you would have if you'd known about it. Antecedently is what produces involuntary action. Your ignorance is what leads you to perform a particular action. If you had known, you wouldn't have done that action. Consequent, uh, consequent ignorance is when your ignorance is a consequence of some choice. You chose to remain ignorant, ignorant about something. You chose not to find out. So that's, that's that distinction. And, and again, good question. He doesn't clarify that for some reason. Um, he gives us this distinction and this terminology, and then he just sort of says, yeah, here, here you go. I think that, I think, based on my reading, I think that the reason he doesn't clarify that so much is because the specific terminology isn't all that important. Because he doesn't use those terms again throughout this chapter, you'll notice. And he doesn't really feel a need to. He just talks about voluntary, involuntary, and non-voluntary, which does the job. He just you know, needs to say, here's how Aquinas explains it, and here are the terms he uses. And he even kind of says here, um, where is it? The adverbs and adjectives are not important. It's basically, he uses terminology. Let's, let's let him use his terminology. Because again, this, is, this, is, this book is meant for this audience, roughly speaking. Right? Non-specialists non -specialists who, uh, who are interested in learning or in some cases perhaps compelled to learn something about this topic. Right? The audience of this text, most, which is basically you all, is not like specialists in Aquinas. This, this book isn't written for me, for example. 
Right? I, I study Aquinas. I know what these terms mean kind of offhandedly. And so sort of dropping them there and then saying, well, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this book, that can kind of make sense, at least I think. So that, that part there, if that is what you're talking about, this is, th he's basically pointing out here that, um, that sin, that is deviation from what we ought to be, what we ought to be striving towards, uh, misdirection, basically, uh, ethical misdirection, is, uh, is in some part, at least, responsible for our, um, I guess you'd say ethical ignorance in this context, that we might, we might fundamentally misunderstand, um, we might fundamentally misunderstand our ethical principles because we, um, because we either, we can, we can couch this in terms of original sin, so our nature is in some sense uh, insufficient uh, or incomplete or, uh, or damaged. We can also talk about this in terms of sin, meaning that our ignorance of uh, basic precepts of natural law and that sort of thing is deviated away from the norm because we, um, because we want it to be in some sense. Right? So if you, to use the shoplifting example, suppose you really want to just take that thing that, that you don't want to pay for, and you think, well, it's not really stealing if it's not stealing from somebody. It's just a big company, and they're not really going to miss it, and so I'm going to keep it in the bottom of my cart. I'm not. No, not, no, not notify anybody that I'm taking it home or anything like that, right? What you're doing there is you are intentionally and deliberately um, reframing your, uh, your knowledge of moral norms because you want to, because you're trying to get something out of it. Right? And so it's those kinds of inclinations that might sort of convince us to, to, um, to reframe our our ethical norms. Another point, of, uh, another part where he mentions this sort of thing is uh, going back a little ways when he talks about uh, whether, so it, it says, it has occurred to many to say that concupiscent or sensual desire can make otherwise voluntary actions involuntary. So this is when he's talking about getting sort of dragged into the bar. Right? So he says, something is voluntary when the will seeks it. Sensuality inclines the will to want what is desired, so sensuality re, uh, renders an act voluntary rather than involuntary. So what he's talking about there is temptation, right? Temptation seems like it might make things involuntary. You're swayed by some passion or something like that. Still, though, the will is what it chooses, and so it is still voluntary to go along with that. And so it is voluntary, right? The desire put upon us by temptation is in fact a desire and it is in fact something that the will pursues and so it is in fact still voluntary. This is very again very similar to this idea that we might willfully be ignorant with respect to moral norms because it will sort of give us a psychological out from condemning ourselves let's say. Okay, so if we go down now to, oops, to this last section on aspects of willing, there's a couple of points that I want to run through here that'll sort of summarize all of this at the very least, which we might have to pick some of this up in the context of next time, but for now, I, I at least want to summarize this view so we can look at what's, what's to come in contrast when we get back from break. Um, because I'll say, um, Anselm's framework of the will and how the will interacts with the intellect is very different but they still have some of the same basic components. It's just that they think that those components sort of interact a little bit differently. So this idea here is that the basic idea is that the will and the intellect have to work together in a sort of dynamic, uh, dynamic union or dynamic interaction to produce acts of willing. So the will he calls rational appetite or the appetitive arm of the intellect. So if the intellect is what cognizes, is what understands ends as bearing the character of the good, the will is what recognizes that good and reaches out towards it, and tries to move towards it, and tries to, try, tries to obtain it. Right? The intellect has to present the will with goods, with things that are good, by recognizing that, hey, there's something good about this. And then the will says, hmm, good, and then we'll go and try and pursue it. The will can then also 
direct the intellect to consider certain things, to think about, is this good or not? And so there is a kind of back and forth dynamic here that the will moves the intellect in terms of efficient causes. So the kind of domino kind of cause, one thing pushing another or driving another. And then the will presents goods to the intellect in, the ter in terms of what he, uh, what, he, what he calls the formal cause. So giving the, uh, the form or the character or the, uh, the shape of the thing, causing it to be in a certain way, like a sculptor uh, a sculptor informing a statue is putting it into a particular shape, in other words. And so these two interact with each other in a sort of back and forth dynamic. The will is only capable of pursuing things that the intellect recognizes as good. Because the will is a faculty for pursuing good, some kind of goodness. Now, if the intellect makes a mistake and thinks that something is good, but it really isn't good, and then the will pursues it, then it is still voluntary because the will is what directs the intellect to consider things in certain ways. And our, uh, our ability to recognize things as good or not is part of our act of, uh, our rational act of willing. So it's this dynamic of the will and the intellect working together that produces what we would probably today call free will, our, our voluntary action. Okay, good so far? Questions on any of that? Is this kind of making sense? So the will is what actually reaches out and chooses and sticks to the good. The intellect is what recognizes something as good. The will directs the intellect towards what to consider and what to think about, and then the intellect presents things for the will, or presents options for the will, put it that way. Like, here's something good, here's something good, here's something else good, what do you want to do? And the will says, I'll do that. Okay. He also wants to draw a distinction here between um, elicited acts of the will and oh, what's the term for the other one? It's right near the beginning. Use, use of the will, that's it. Okay, well, why was that hard? Okay, so elicited acts of the will are simply choices. The choice that you make sort of in here. So that is the conscious, deliberate choice to do something. The use of the will is the will using some other faculty that we have. So he uses this example of raising your hand, right? This is actually a very common example of this. So you might say, I choose to raise my hand. The problem might be that if I'm choosing to raise my hand, but I'm carrying something very heavy, maybe I'm not able to do that. Or I can't actually raise my hand over my head without dropping the thing first. So I might still choose to raise my hand and go, oh, right, I'm carrying a thing, and not be able to do so. I've still made the choice. I've still elicited the act of will, but I've not been able to use my other faculties to do so. However, if I choose to raise my hand, then what I have done is raised my hand. Now Aquinas says that these are the same thing. These are part of the same action because they are, they are both directed towards the same end and not, as one, not with one as a means to the other, but both of which are the same means towards that end, right? If my action is to raise my hand, then I just, I raise my hand. The raising of my hand is part of the action that is the elicitation of the will, but it's the outward aspect of it. And so this is how he gets away with things, uh, gets away from problems like, well, what if you choose to do something, but can't finish, but then just don't actually do it? Like, what if I choose to raise my hand, but then just don't raise my hand? Yeah, right, so the answer Aquinas would say is no, you didn't. Like if you chose to do something and then just didn't follow through with it, then you just didn't choose to do it, and that's all there is to it, right? Sorry for the rhyme. In a case like that, though, the reason this is a problem is are things like getting moral credit or getting moral blame for choices that you don't carry through or you don't carry out. It's like having that pantry full of canned goods and saying, you know what, I'm gonna go donate, I'm gonna donate all of these to the soup kitchen and then you go to sleep. No, you don't get credit for that. Yeah, you, fine, you 
decided to do it, but what really happened is you said you decided to do it. You said to yourself in your innermost thought, I'm going to do this, and then you didn't do it. You lied. Maybe you lied. Maybe you just didn't fully commit to what you were doing. What's that? Yeah, right? So you didn't actually do the thing, though, right? So you might, you might say you chose to, but you really didn't. When you choose to do something, it's actually doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So another, another very important aspect of this is that, and this is something that he shares in common with Anselm, but Anselm emphasizes it a lot more. So we're going to look at it way more then. So I'll kind of leave us with this. That a choice that the will has is not between options A and B. Right? It's not, should I fill this with coffee or should I fill this with water? Those are two choices. Should I fill it with coffee? Yes or no. Should I fill it with water? Yes or no. Doing one of them does, in fact, exclude the other. If I fill it with water, I can't very well fill it with coffee, and vice versa. But the choice that the will has is a yes or no choice, not an either or choice. It's not A or B. It's either A or not A, B or not B. So do I pursue this good or do I not pursue it? That's the choice being presented. And so choosing not to act in a, particular circumstance, in a particular circumstance is still a choice. It is still an action. It's just choosing to not act. Okay. We're going to talk about that like Thursday when, or Tuesday when we get back, because Anselm explains this, I think, a lot more thoroughly and probably better. Um, and then that, that question is also going to come up here and there as well, because again, we might have, there might be ethical differences between, um, between simply refraining from acting and acting in a different way and things like that. Good question, though.